welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. And today it's time for a Strange New Worlds debriefing. And what that means is this episode is going to be a little bit different than the typical format that we follow here at Trek Untold. Normally, this show is just a purely interview show only. Each week I talk to different folks who have been part of the Star Trek universe in some way or another. But what we're going to do right now is a little bit more current events. And frankly, I'm excited to start doing more of these because it's fun, of course, doing all these interviews, but sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit left out in talking about what's going on in the world of Trek right now today. And I'm a big fan of Strange New Worlds. I think a lot of my listeners out there are. So yeah, I'm super happy today to spend some time talking about a show that I'm really enjoying as I'm actually enjoying it. And the way that these debriefings are going to work is that they're essentially going to be like mini-sodes. So they're not going to be the full-on, typical, enormous interviews that we do here on Trek Untold. What it's going to be is one part, my review and thoughts about a certain episode of Strange New Worlds, and then we're going to follow it up with an interview. And this week, we're going to be discussing Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, the third episode of Strange New Worlds that just aired last week. And we're going to be joined a little bit later on by a very, very special guest, because we're going to be joined by La Noonien Singh herself, Christina Chong. So stick around for that, but first things first, I think I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about the first two episodes of the series as well, because Strange New World Season 2 I think kicked off in a really, really big, great way. We began with The Broken Circle, and then Episode 2 was Ad Astra Prospera, and in my opinion these are two very strong episodes. I really like them both. The thing about The Broken Circle is I felt like while it was a very good episode, I was curious why they went with that as the first one of the season. I know I saw a lot of folks also kind of being confused by it. Maybe one part confusion and one part just wanting to complain about things. And the biggest thing I saw was folks were like, where's Pike? And that is kind of a fair point here because after all, Pike is your lead of the show. But on the other hand, Strange New Worlds is an ensemble show and they don't need to have Pike in every single episode. But I do agree that it was kind of funny that he was essentially absent from the season two premiere. But the nice thing about that was that that also meant we got to focus on more of that ensemble cast and really see them in action. And while it hasn't been that long ago since season one debuted, it's nice to get the gang back together again. And this was a wonderful way, I think, to kick off the season by having them be more of the focal point on the episode. And I also got to give a shout out to Emma Ho, who we interviewed her and her brother Ian last season on Trek Untold. And they were the youngest guests I ever had on this podcast here. They were wonderful to talk to. And I didn't know that Emma was going to show up again and be reprising her character that we saw back in Strange New Worlds last season. So yeah, that was just exciting. Well done there. Really cool to see her again. But as far as The Broken Circle, this was an overall, I think, a very good episode. And what was cool for me, I think, was actually seeing more of Dr. Mbenga. You know, last season, the focus of his story was all about him and his daughter. And that has essentially concluded. There's going to be really, I don't imagine, any follow-ups to that. So that part of his life is done. Now we get to see a little bit more of him being, for lack of a better term in sci-fi, a war doctor. Of course, that doesn't mean the timey-wimey way a lot of you might be thinking, but he was a combat medic essentially during some pretty big wars here, and it was cool to see him kind of, you know, go back into that character while also not being so great because this is him kind of battling with those inner demons that he has. That said, I do enjoy seeing the pairing of Nurse Chapel and Dr. Mbenga on an away mission. That was just exciting to see. And it was also nice to see Babs showing off some of his actual martial arts skills, because if some of you folks out there don't know, uh, Babs is actually a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so the guy has some legitimate fighting credits, and it's nice to see him get to do some stunt work. The episode is also notable because Spock gets to sit in the captain's chair, and that was really, really interesting, seeing him take the con and essentially take control of an entire situation, and really, he got into some pretty heavy waters here. And like I said, overall, I think it's a really great episode, but compare it then to Ad Astra Per Aspera, and man, it's just like leagues above it, and that's not even a bad thing either. That's not saying that the Broken Circle was a bad episode. It's just, man, Ad Astra Per Aspera was just so great, and I would say like this is one of the best Star Trek episodes of all time. And I don't think that I'm alone when I say that. I saw a lot of the comments out there on the internets talking about this episode here, and a lot of folks thought the exact same thing that I was thinking of what was going on. Like, this is what Star Trek is all about. Court dramas aren't a foreign concept in the Star Trek universe. We have them going all the way back to the original series, in fact, in the very first season. And that, oddly enough, does coincide with Pike a little bit. But court dramas aren't really anything new to the Star Trek universe, and they've always been, for the most part, very, very good to watch. They bring up a lot of interesting points in a way that is different from the typical away missions, going out and having some action. 
It keeps things a little more grounded and cemented, also to a degree, in our reality, because we all understand the court system more or less in America and wherever else folks are watching. So having that kind of reflects more on contemporary times for viewers like us to be able to just jump into it a little bit easier. So episodes like that are kind of, I think, a necessity to bring us back to our contemporary times. And as far as court dramas go in Star Trek, I mean, again, this one absolutely is one of the top ones up there. Ranking up there with Measure of a Man, ranking up there with the drum head. It was just excellent storytelling top to bottom. And this time around, yeah, we got to have Pike as the focal point because that's what he was doing when episode one was happening. And this is again where I kind of wonder, you know, like, did they choose to have the Broken Circle be the debut because Pike was away doing this and they felt that a court drama wouldn't be as exciting? Or was it that they really just wanted it to be like that and have the ensemble kind of be uh, having the spotlight for that first episode? I don't really know the answer to that, unfortunately, uh, but I'd love to hear any theories that you guys have out there because I know there was some debate about what should have been the first episode or how that first episode was handled. But as far as Ad Astra Per Aspera, which by the way in Latin means, uh, I believe it's like a rough road leads to the stars, and that's absolutely the truth of this episode here. And I love that, once again, Strange New Worlds is hearkening back to those original Star Trek titles with those very lofty, fairly pretentious, but still lets you know what's going on within the episode thanks to a very clever title. And this time around, again, it was an ensemble story, but the focus was Pike and Una. And this was just, again, top to bottom, beautiful storytelling here, very emotional storytelling as well. You know, I didn't think I'd get this much emotion from watching a courtroom drama, but here we are. And also hats off to Yatidi Badake, who I apologize if I'm saying her name wrong, but she did just a stellar job in this episode. Her work was amazing. She deserves an Emmy nomination for what she did as the defendant for Una, like just amazing here. And there's a fun little Easter egg here too, by the way, within her character. And I know I saw a lot of folks talking about this, how she had the literal Starfleet regulations in the form of an actual physical book, not on a pad device, but an actual printed hardcover book. And that is indeed a throwback to the original Star Trek series, because even as far as that time period, they still were actually using hardcover books to have the Starfleet rules and regulations. And I would imagine that yes, while they're in the future and they can have all the pad devices they want to have, at the end of the day, the tradition of law being in a book just adds so much more gravity to the rules and the weight of what the Federation itself means. So hardly an anachronism, it actually very much makes sense. So again, just great work for the first two episodes here, and the Ad Astra Prospera, this is gonna be one of the most memorable episodes of Strange New Worlds. And it is a tough act to follow by far. And then along comes episode three, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And wow, wow, and wow. Like I get goosebumps right now just thinking about it because what a ride this episode was. Now, if you're wondering why this episode was called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and yada, 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 well, that is a quote from that Scottish play. It's from Macbeth. And it's a line that Macbeth himself does say after I believe Lady Macbeth dies. And while I used to know this by heart, I'm going to cheat today with my communicator device and just read you what the entire speech is, what the entire monologue is. And that is, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out! Out, brief candle! Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And that is absolutely, I think, the perfect way to kind of summarize this episode, because, whew, man, there is a lot to discuss in this one here. So as I mentioned, this one is all about law, and this is a Christina Chong-centric episode, but it's not just Christina here, because we've also got a Paul Wesley episode. This is a Laan and Kirk adventure. And that feels like an unexpected pairing, and it absolutely is, because going into this episode, you know, I don't watch the trailers anymore to get a preview of what's going to happen next, so I go into them completely blind, not knowing what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, seeing Kirk show up, it just was like, what's going on here? And it just got better and better. It snowballed, and it really, like, subverted a lot of my expectations for the episode here, because it kind of started out as, like, this little time travel mystery, and then it becomes even more of a time travel mystery, because they go from an alternate timeline down to the past, and then the story kind of becomes almost this like rom-com, this romantic comedy of what's going to happen, will they, won't they, while they're also trying to solve the mystery of why they've been quantum leaps down to this time period, and then the story of her eventually getting back and dealing with the repercussions of the events that unfolded. And I gotta tell you too, for an hour-long episode, it is tight. There's a lot here. Like, this could have easily been a 90-minute episode. This probably could have even pulled off a two-parter. And time travel stories too, I think in sci-fi, can be very hit or miss. You know, obviously Doctor Who, we don't have to worry about that. But in Star Trek, they can be a little bit hit or miss. And even in other forms of media, I'd say the same thing. But this was a great one also because it focused on the humanity 
of our two characters that we're following around here, focused on their relationship, which again brings it kind of back to something that we all can understand a little bit better than the timey-wimey elements of Star Trek. And I had a lot of thoughts after watching this one. And I think the first one I want to address here is that I feel like Paul Wesley really showed off as Kirk in this one. And that might be a controversial statement to say to a lot of you folks out there, but I do stand by that. I, you know, when I saw Paul Wesley in the season finale of season one, I was, you know, mixed. But I also understood that that Kirk that we were seeing was not prime timeline Kirk. That was an alternate universe Kirk. This was a wartime Kirk especially, so he wasn't going to necessarily have the same traits we've all expected to have of a Kirk in other versions of his appearances. So here in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, this one, again, it's an alternate timeline Kirk, but it's not as far away as it was previously. So this time around, we got to see more of the charming persona of who Captain Kirk is as done in the style of Paul Wesley. And for sure, this is not going to be your William Shatner Kirk. This is not your Chris Pine Kirk. This is a Paul Wesley Kirk. It's his own being, and I very much like what he was doing with the part. And to be honest, I know a lot of folks out there, they kind of want to see the Shatnerisms. There are some in there. There's some very subtle ones that are hidden in his acting. But for the most part, he is doing his own thing. I admire that he's doing that. Uh, but it also does still feel like the idea and the essence of who Kirk is without going into the Shatner parts of it, because I don't need to hear that again. And if you really want to hear that again, well, yeah, you got Paramount Plus, so go watch the original series there. But truth be told, I think he absolutely is going to quiet down a lot of the haters here. And we know that Kirk is going to show up again as the season progresses. So very excited to see what's going to be next for him, especially once we do get proper timeline Kirk showing up. Now, Christina Chong, I think she put on a masterpiece performance in this episode here because her character really is a very complex type of character. There's a lot to unpack with her. And I think that Christina got to really showcase her abilities here and her range of acting. Because again, like I said, this covered a few different genres ultimately that merged into one by the end. And it really was just a very heartbreaking episode by the time that it was done. I mean, you know, it starts off one thing, ends with another, and man, what gravity this had. Because like we said with that quote from Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, it very much was about the futility that she can't change the past. She has to now address it head on. And at the same time, she's watching her love now die in front of her. And then she comes back to her actual timeline where none of that even happened, none of that mattered, because that Kirk that's in her timeline is completely different. It's, it's so much going on there. It's mind-blowing how they pulled this off, and it's all just wonderfully done. Really, Christina should be absolutely proud of herself for this one. And again, I want to address another little point I saw online here about how at the very end of the episode, and of course, major spoilers, but if you're watching this, you've already seen this. Uh, one of the things that a lot of folks were talking about was how at the very end, Christina goes in to actually come face to face with Khan, Nooney, and Singh. And that is a pretty big moment here, because not only does she address him, she talks to him, whatever, uh, says a lot to him. I mean, she's not just facing her past, she's now facing her present and her ancestry. But the thing that a lot of folks think were talking about the most was how she comes in there and she leaves her handgun in the room with this child. Let's just rewind that again. She left a handgun in the room of the person who we know as Khan, Nooney, and Singh, who would later take over half the world practically and become like one of the most horrible tyrants out there. She put the gun in his room. And a lot of folks are just talking about various things about that. And really, you know, we don't know all the history about Khan. We don't know where things began or ended. We don't know what happened with that gun either, if it really made a difference. But chances are, this might have been the starting point to him getting his freedom and becoming the Khan that we all know by the time Space Seed and ultimately Wrath of Khan comes around. So again, timey-wimey, very, very much timey-wimey what this all means, but uh, I believe there was some actual meaning to put in that gun there. And if we do get more of Khan in later on Star Trek series, which we probably will, I think this will be a little bit more of a fleshed out point down the line. So I would consider this sowing the seeds for what the future may hold. So overall, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow was just purely amazing. What a great episode. Loved every minute of it. And man, again, it sucks that it's going up right against Ad Astra Per Aspera, because you have like one of the best episodes of Star Trek of all time, and then immediately following it, another one of the, probably, you know, I, I want to say it's one of the best of all time too. I, I'm going to go as far as to say that, because I think it's true. I think this one's going to really hold up and be a very strong one. Definitely one of the strongest of Strange New Worlds. And that's also saying a lot here. It's just like, man, to follow that is a tough act. And um, I would say that they did it. So that's my thoughts on tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, as well as some brief ones on the first two episodes of season two here. But I also want to hear your thoughts about these first three episodes. So make sure no matter where you're listening or watching, hit me up on social media at Trek Untold on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and leave me a comment down there as well. And let's keep the discussion going. 
So that was my thoughts on this episode, but now it's time to get the thoughts of a person who is actually there. So let's go ahead and beam in our guest for this week, and that would be Christina Chong. We're going to talk about Strange New Worlds. We're going to talk about some other things as well as some future episode tidbits that you guys are going to really want to hear. So without further ado, computer, access interview file. Christina Chong, welcome to Trek Untold. Hello. It's so awesome to meet you. Uh, very excited. I really enjoyed the most recent episode. Uh, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. It's like one of the best Trek episodes with a Shakespeare quote in its title. Uh, <laughs> and this episode has quite a lot of development for your character. We're going to break it down as we go on here today. But how excited were you, Christina, to get such a complex episode centered around your character? I was completely blown away uh especially when I realized I was actually in every scene yeah and I'd never done that before so it was a, a great challenge in both stamina and you know carrying a whole episode you know that I'd never never had that been given that opportunity so I was very excited and to be working with Paul as well who I get on great with was just a dream yeah, i think a lot of viewers take for granted the endurance it takes to actually do an episode that's really all about one person because this is essentially you know an hour with just la nuni and Singh. that's a lot of work for you mm -hmm. yeah we were shooting mostly outside in toronto as well so we had the daylight to factor in and obviously normally we would you know be in the studio we'd have as long as we wanted but when you've got daylight to to put into the equation, it means you have to wrap and start at a certain time, which means you only have a certain amount of hours to sleep. And so, yeah, the mental focus needed to not go into that tired mentality, um, the discipline to get home, uh, unwind, certain amount of time to unwind, certain amount of time to prepare the next script. I always need a bath at the end of the night. So I had to have my bath. And then to get into bed and sleep and wake up to meditate, to start the day right. All of those, you know, um, routine things had to be very strict. And what would you say is a more difficult shoot for you typically? Working on a Star Trek episode like this one in the middle of bustling Canada and shooting at odd hours and having to deal with the daylight issue, as you mentioned, or shooting on green screens and AR walls for like a Star Trek episode that takes place on the bridge or in a different planet? Oh, those are much easier. Those are much really? easier. Yeah, yeah. Getting out and about in Toronto is harder because we you, you're dealing with the weather as well. And we were filming in minus 17 degrees. And there was snow on one of the days as well. Like we were in a blizzard and we just happened to have found the perfect little pocket in Toronto where we filmed the car chase, the end of the car chase when the cops catch us. There was a wind, like a wind tunnel wherever we were shooting it was just the coldest part of Toronto we could have found and oh my goodness Paul and I both get really cold very quickly and we were we had so much every scene we had so much underneath our clothes I mean I was like I don't care if I look 20 pounds overweight this is like <laughs> I've got patches of of those heat pads everywhere. I've got I've got several layers of thermals on I was like I don't care give it me all. I mean, this is a Kirk and Laon adventure. And you just talked about a little bit here working with Paul Wesley. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because based on your Instagram, it looks like both you guys, you know, you're going to work, you're doing your job, but I don't think you guys are doing any work. You're just having fun. <laughs> it kind of felt like that. It genuinely did. Um, but that, what you see on Instagram, it was literally like that before every scene. And that's no joke. You can ask <laughs> the crew and the, the directors and, and Amanda would be like, Hey, here we go. We just got to wait for them to like get the subs together. So I think it would have been a lot less fun if if Paul wouldn't have if Paul hadn't been there with me. But yeah, and also Carol as well. Carol Kane, she is hilarious also. And so factor in me and Paul laughing like hyenas, and then Carol being the funniest actress I've ever worked with. Like we're there like this, like shaking and giggling off camera in her close-ups. That's just not the done thing, but I couldn't help it. I'm sorry, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, Carol has like amazing range. Anyway, she can do the serious drama or she can do the laugh out loud comedy. 
And uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about working with her. Uh, you know, I know we can't talk about anything that's happened beyond this episode yet, but just, you know, in general, what has it been like working with someone so experienced as Carol Kane? Oh my goodness. I've learned so much from her because she just in the moment, like she's so in, in there. She's like, and that's why she doesn't break character when I'm laughing in her face in the close up. Like, I mean, that's awful. I mean, I really was trying not to, but it's like laughing in church, you know? That's a great it's way like, to put it. Yeah, it's like you cannot laugh in church, but that makes you want to laugh more. And so she is one of those actresses who just in the moment will, she's being it. She's completely being it. She's in that moment and she'll just come up with these improvisations or ad libs here and there which completely adds to the character in a an unexpected way and that's what threw me like <laughs> those little bits that she would bring in I was like that is hilarious and so on point um so yeah she is the nicest person as well she has a little dog who little Johnny I think his name is um who which she'd show us pictures of and just a really lovely human being. Like you wouldn't, you know, Carol Kane, like she's no diva and she's just so lovely down to earth. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just rewatching uh, an episode of The Ready Room, which was all about last season's Elysian Kingdom. And somebody in there was talking about how like Anson Mount was ad-libbing. You just said Carol Kane was doing ad-libbing. And like in Star Trek, you don't ad-lib. That's like a new <laughs> thing, it sounds like. Is that something that's actually encouraged on the set of Strange New Worlds? Well, it, no. Actually, okay. no, it's not at all. But um, I kind of like to do that. So every now and then, if I felt like I could, I would push it. But then um, they always want one to script. And then once we've got that, but obviously we don't often have time to do more than a couple of takes. Uh, but when we came to episode seven, the crossover episode, they were allowed to obviously ad lib Jack and Tawny because that's the nature of their show. And so we were also asked to do the same. Oh, okay. Well, now I got something really and, to look forward to. Yeah. So then we were like, oh, a little bit. I was a bit stumped. I was like, oh, hang on a minute. I have to, oh, right. Hang on. I can't, yeah. So, um, so that was great. And that kind of like gave us a bit of license to keep doing it in further episodes. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, back to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. This is such a heartbreaking episode. Like, it starts out as a fun time travel rom-com with a romance story between Lon and Kirk. And then events unfold, and it's leading to Lon facing her past while watching someone she loves die in front of her. And, uh, Christina, that final scene is tremendous with you and your with, with Lon. I, I want to say you, but, you know, with Lon in your room. Uh, amazing acting from you. I was weeping at the end of that. Uh, so I'd love oh. to hear if you can talk to me about the emotions of your character throughout this episode, the growth that she takes from minute one to the final moments, and how you approached all of this. Because this, this is some heavy stuff. Yeah, so for me, um, it was a delicate balance between transitioning La'an from the reserve standoffish office officer as we know her to slowly unfolding and letting her guard down and so it took a few goes actually there were a few times where you know Amanda and then we also had Anitra Johnson one of the writers helping us and um I didn't get it right first time like there were a few times especially one I think the first the first um, the first thing we shot was, uh, the kiss scene, actually. One of the first things we did together was the, the kiss. So that was the scene that was hardest to pitch. Cause I was like, I, I, we haven't done anything else before that. Like, I don't know where, where to pitch it yet. You know, where, how far is she? I don't know where. So, and also the end scene was one of the first scenes we shot as well. Wow. So I had to work work towards that earn the right to get there so I was backtracking a lot of the emotion um and going from uh so 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 what I did in my head when I prepared the script is I I personalized it all chronologically so that then when I needed to dip into the scene I knew exactly what emotion it was personally so I just I just had to do it like that because we were just all back to front and shooting it in all different um orders that I I there was no way I could have not done it like that you know 
Well, that's even more amazing hearing that that was the method that you guys had to do. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I want to spend a little more time also talking about Paul uh, because you know throughout Trekdom, Paul has taken a lot of fa- uh, a lot of flack from some Trekkies out there about his representation as Kirk, and I think a lot of it's been very unfair, honestly. Um, so you know, I- I've been really excited for people to watch this one because this has been a great episode for Paul as much as it has been for you here. Um, so you know, my question here with you is, what do you think about the response that folks have given? Some folks have given to Paul as Kirk, and do you think it's unfair? Uh, to be honest, I have only, I, I heard about those those things and I've read a couple of things, but what I've also read more of is people going, oh, I didn't think I liked Paul as Kirk and he's proved me wrong after tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. That's what I've been reading loads of. So I think it was the fact of, you know, he had one episode to portray Kirk in season one. And people were judging him off of that one episode. And that was an alternate timeline episode. And that, you know, and he's not yeah. playing the Kirk. Look at Uhura, for example, or Spock. They're not playing um, Nimoy or, you know, Nichols characters. They're playing the, the pre and they're playing their own version of it. There's mm-hmm. impossible to like, impossible. We're, we're so unique and different as people. How can you possibly give an exact same portrayal of a character it's just not not possible so um so yeah I think he does an amazing job as Kirk um I think he really does embody that um Mm -hmm. character and the essence of Kirk very much so so yeah yeah this episode I think is going to absolutely change a lot of people's minds and it's funny because just because you know you mentioned like folks who are playing now Uhura and Spock these legacy roles and likewise, you know, you are playing a legacy role too as a descendant of Khan, but you're not out there delivering Ricardo Montalban monologues at all. <laughs> no, exactly. And it's also I have freedom to like, you know, because we've not met Laan before, so I have freedom to go where I want, do what I want, you know, be who I want, um, and set the set the Laan bar wherever you know the writers want it to be. So, um, yeah, I, my job's a lot easier than theirs. <laughs> And by the way, congratulations are in order to you, Christina, because this summer you have a new EP out. Can you tell us about Twin Flames? Congratulations to you so much. Thank you so much. So yeah, Twin Flames, the EP drops August 11th and Twin Flames, the single is out now, Spotify and iTunes and all major platforms. Um, and it's just funny that it's dropped at the same time as the uh, episode three, Kirk and La'an love story, because actually... Kirk and La'an are twin flames. A twin flame is somebody that you only meet, is two parts of the same kind of being or soul, whatever you want to say. Um, And they meet every four lifetimes, apparently, and um, often can't be together because of whatever trauma they're still solving within themselves. And that's exactly La'an and Kirk's journey. So I'm loving all of the... um, reels with the the Kirk on reels with the twin flames audio um so yeah it's it's very apt <laughs> all right well last question for you today christina uh right now you know folks aren't watching a video version we got audio only here but i'm watching you play with a doggo right now a nice pupper friend you got there this isn't actually runa this is my this is my puppy niece this is i was Lion- gonna say yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering because I was like, did they suddenly have a metamorphosis? But yeah, I was actually going to ask you, you know, we saw Princess Runa in uh, Elysian Kingdom. Any yeah. chance we're going to see her back again in Strange New Worlds? No. Oh, no. Not this season. I did try. I did try to get it in with Carol in this episode. <laughs> I suggested to Amanda, the director, I said, Amanda, what about Runa being Carol's dog in the episode right so for, i'm not spoiling anything for a- anyone who's not seen the episode um and because i thought that is gonna work because it's timey wimey and you know it's we never established because also runa was in a fantasy episode but amanda also directed the fantasy episode hmm. and so <laughs> amanda was like mm, but she was in my episode last season i was like mm-hmm. and you know that she's really good <laughs> and she's and she's very well behaved and she can do it. And I asked Carol first and Carol's like, yes, I love it. And Carol has a dog of her own. So she loves Runa. 
And uh, she was like, yes, please, I really want, I really want Runa in it. Um, but Amanda said no. Uh, well, there's always season three and beyond, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more beyond for you guys. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Well, congratulations again, Christina. Everybody can check out Twin Flames on Spotify right now. After you listen to this podcast episode, uh, Christina, thank you so much for talking today. And really, you did some beautiful work on this episode. Uh, I love seeing you be able to portray so much emotion and range in here. Uh, just amazing work. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold and our Strange New Worlds debriefing. Thank you so much for checking this out. I'd love to hear what you think about this and what you think about this format. I'd love to do more reviews like this. So if you guys are liking this, let me know. And the best way to do that is to hit me up on social media and of course also to follow me there too. And that's at Instagram, at Twitter, Facebook, and yes, even TikTok, all at Trek Untold. If you're watching this on YouTube too, don't forget to leave a comment and a thumbs up on this video. And hey, don't forget to subscribe either. And that's youtube.com slash at Trek Untold. If you'd like to support this podcast, go ahead and visit patreon.com slash Trek Untold. And you can see some of the different ways that you can support this very show. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz. This has been Trek Untold. We will see you next time. And as always, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.